welcome to everyone. Well, as uh, director of the foundation, I, I speak uh, certainly for our Board of Governors. We're delighted to have been partnering with uh, the National Bureau of Asian Research uh, since their inception. We helped uh, make them into uh, a, an institution, and we've stuck with them for uh, upwards of 25 years. Um, Senator Jackson, I still call him Senator Jackson. <laughs> Senator Jackson was a deep believer in uh, getting the expertise that's out in the uh, academic world and bringing it to the policy world. He himself reached out to professors and brought them to his Senate office and visited them at the University of Washington. And it meant a lot to him to have that kind of expertise, particularly on Asia. And it was a dream of his to create an institution that would bridge that gap and so he was thinking about that shortly before his death, and the Jackson Foundation uh, tried to bring that into reality with the creation of NBR, and we've been delighted with this partnership. And I think that this Engaging Asia 2015 forum today is a perfect example of this mixture of really policy expertise in our nation's capital. Um, I have the honor today of introducing our opening speaker, uh, keynote speaker, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii. I was very impressed with Congresswoman Gabbard's um, CV. She is clearly a rising star in foreign policy, and she appears to be quite uh, a brave and honest voice in this town, and, and that's really quite quite exciting for all of us. She is also one of only two female combat veterans in Congress. And uh, as a military uh, veteran and as a current reservist, uh, Congresswoman Gabbard has served two tours of combat duty in the Middle East, becoming the first female distinguished honor graduate at Fort McClellan's Officer Candidate School and the first woman ever to receive an award of appreciation from the Kuwaiti military. She was also order, uh, awarded the Meritorious Service Medal during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, and as a member of Congress now, she is uh, serving on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. And, and in that, she joins a distinguished uh, record of people that we've worked closely with, like Norm Dix. So um, uh, it's my great honor to ask you to come up today, Congresswoman. Thank you very much, Laura, for your kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today to talk about this region in the world, uh, I think that rightly so, is grabbing everyone's attention. Uh, I know for several years now, people have talked about the pivot or the rebalance, but generally there's been, um, uh, you, which word you use is enough to start a debate between folks. What does pivot actually mean? What does rebalance mean if you're... If you're pivoting somewhere, does that mean you're taking away from somewhere else? So uh, I think the bottom line and why I appreciate this forum today is because um, regardless of your view, there's no question and there is no debate about the, um, the great potential and the fact that there's great opportunity that lies within this Asia-Pacific region as a whole, regardless of which area you're coming from. If you're coming at this from an economic perspective, or you're coming at this from a trade perspective, or you're coming at this from a security perspective. Uh, I think there is so much going on on each of these fronts that it absolutely warrants the attention um, that this organization has given it and that you're giving it by being here today. You know, I've been in Congress now. This is my third year. Uh, and running for Congress from a place like Hawaii, when people talk about the Asia-Pacific region, it's really been a way of life uh, for me. I've grown up there almost my whole life, and... Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're talking about culturally or economically or from a security perspective, right in our backyard being situated in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I'd like to say we get the region naturally uh, and understand the dynamics there uh, better than most folks, uh, perhaps who've been focused on looking east, who've been spending their careers looking east towards Europe. Uh, I can tell you that there have been a number of congressional delegations that I have welcomed in to Hawaii who've stopped there on the way to or from Asia and been a part of those delegations. Uh, and it's amazing to see how once they get off the plane in Hawaii, get back on the plane and land in Japan or South Korea or Beijing or, or wherever, they're always struck by the distance. 
like that flight was really long. <laughs> I do it a few times a month, so it's uh, it comes second nature. But unless you actually get out there, the sheer distance, what that means, what that um, strategic element that for us in Hawaii, having the Pacific Command located there as a headquarters and the military assets that we have, what that advantage of time gives you when you look at the sheer distance of the ocean and the fact that the Pacific Command itself covers 53% of the Earth's surface. Uh, when you look at that and you look at the impact of that and the opportunity that we have given what's happening around the world, given the hot spots that we see occurring in different regions of the world, I would say without a doubt that when you look at the Asia Pacific region and you look at the fact that at least until this point things have been stable. That's not by happenstance and that's not by chance. It's been through a concerted effort of proactive and positive engagement um, with each of these major countries, both our partners, our treaty allies, and those who are looking to seek stronger partnerships with. So coming here, I was excited to be uh, placed on the Asia Pacific Subcommittee on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where we deal with the widest variety of issues from uh, economic issues to human rights to security and stability issues and and being on the two committees of foreign affairs and armed services for me I really have a lot of fun because these are serious issues that I'm very passionate about but I think these are also two of the most bipartisan committees that we have here in Congress at a time when the divisiveness between parties unfortunately causes so much gridlock uh, whether uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee or on Armed Services, as we bring amendments, as we bring bills for markup before the committees. If you ever go there, you'll find that there is legitimate, authentic debate on these issues where people's minds can be changed, and you never know if the vote's going to go one way or the other. Even if the leadership of the committee on the Democrat or Republican side states a position on a specific issue, that doesn't necessarily predetermine the outcome of the issue. So it's, it's something that I appreciate because... Uh, it gives all of us the opportunity to bring issues that we care very much about forward and really to be able to argue those points. Uh, I feel like this is something that, you know, we learn about in school in Civics 101, that this is how it's supposed to work. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise, but unfortunately uh, it's still a, a rarity here that, that you actually get to have things work out that way. As we look at um, the changing power roles in the Asia-Pacific region, I wanted to talk with you a little bit today uh, about India. Uh, there's a lot that people talk about uh, in raising concerns with what's happening in the Asia-Pacific region, what's happening in the South China Sea. Uh, but I think it's important that as we look at concerns in the region, that we provide an equal level of focus on the opportunity. Uh, it's also opportune time to talk about this with uh, Prime Minister Modi just having uh, been here, having met with the president, uh, having um, gone to Silicon Valley and had uh, a very productive engagement with uh, leaders in the tech sector uh, and focusing a lot on innovation, on how to bring about, in his words, digital India to empower uh, their economy, uh, and to really empower people. When you look at the diversity that exists within that country, he talked about, I, I was there in San Jose when he went and visited with uh, close to 20,000 people who came to see him, and he talked about the over 600 million people in India who are under the age of 25. That's almost double the population of our entire country. So when you look at how India is on the brink of this explosion and growth and development and opportunity, uh, the Prime Minister is highlighting the point that this is, this is and will be happening uh, by fueling it through these 1,200 million hands, as he says. Uh, I was in India for the first time this last December uh, at the Prime Minister's invitation. Uh, I visited seven cities over three weeks and met with a, a wide variety of people from you know, the highest government officials to the top industrialists whose names uh, most people will recognize to the entrepreneurs and startups, to college students, to, you know, uh, grade school students, to small business owners, to mid-sized business owners, uh, to farmers. Each of these different areas in these different seven cities that I went to, I was struck by the optimism uh, and the excitement that was equally felt 
all across the board that this time right now for India, they see as a unique opportunity where the tides will change in a historic way uh, and leveraging technology and innovation to being able to empower people in the smallest and most rural villages who barely have basic infrastructure that we enjoy of toilets and running water and clean water. Um, there is so much hunger to seeing how not only they can leverage technology to provide economic opportunity to women, to farmers, to individuals, to families, uh, but also how this technology can be leveraged to be able to solve some of these basic um, needs and challenges of these communities. So it was exciting to hear the Prime Minister talk about that and to be able to, to meet with him with a small group of other members of Congress to talk about the areas of commonality between our two countries. Uh, serving on the Armed Services Committee, obviously the, uh, the opportunity for further security engagement was one that I was focused on with him, especially given the rise of Islamic extremism and groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda within the region, uh, with their country bordering with Pakistan and the issues that they have had uh, there. Uh, and uh, the Prime Minister really being invested in, in leaning forward uh, and taking action to uh, prevent those elements from uh, really taking a stronghold uh, in India. I think the, the partnership that we've seen from our military leadership, specifically from the Pacific Command, to the point where they do more military engagements with India than any other country in the region and recognize India's rising role of leadership within the region. Uh, some would say India is still a developing country. The Prime Minister would disagree with that, I think, because he sees the potential that is there uh, and the leadership role that he plans on taking India to within the region and around the world. So examining India, examining their initiatives in uh, whether it's technology, whether it's tourism, trade, security, in a variety of different areas, I think it gives us the opportunity to lift a lot of the misperceptions that I think still exist here in the United States about India um, that maybe fit in a different time but are not relevant to um, the quickly moving and very dynamic situation uh, within that country and to build these bridges to start these conversations. Uh, there are also misperceptions in India about the United States and the United States feeling towards India. So when we look at some of the obstacles um, that still exist between our two countries and being able to further some of these opportunities, I've seen even in a short period of time in the last year how uh, a lot of progress has been made simply through going back to kind of the basics of politics, right? The basics of diplomacy, which is building relationships uh, and having those conversations, not only between presidents and prime ministers, but between government officials, between business leaders, between entrepreneurs, uh, between startups, um, educational institutions, healthcare institutions, and seeing how we can best leverage the assets that each of us brings to the table um, to benefit our own communities, to benefit our own economies, to, to solve some of the challenges uh, that we are facing. Uh, I've heard from uh, leaders in India who are talking about trying to deal with the challenge of, of delivering quality education to students who live in uh, far-flung communities uh, and who don't have the ability to access opportunity within the urban core. This is an issue that many of our states and communities face across the country. It's an issue that my constituents in Hawaii face who live in small communities on different islands who can't afford airfare and who, who will never have the opportunity that those who live in the heart of the city have. Uh, so there, there are a lot of opportunities that I'm excited about to see how we can further this partnership, further this relationship, and take advantage of the small, relatively small window, I believe, that's before us of the energy and excitement that we're feeling coming from India towards the United States and wanting to strengthen this friendship and partnership, as well as the excitement that I've heard and that I'm seeing that people are starting to recognize here in the United States about the opportunity to invest in India, to partner with India, and uh, uh, be a part of this um, trajectory that is planned and that I foresee will uh, be brought about with India. 
Uh, so with that, I've got a few more minutes here. I've got about five minutes before I've got to take off. I'd love to answer some questions if you have any. Oh. So we have time um, maybe for just one or, one or two questions. Uh, I'm not sure how strict we're going to be. Uh, well, I, I'll ask you one question, sure. though, that it, it, the interesting dynamic between India and China, and of course we've just had the, the big... Uh, visit in, in Seattle where I'm from with President Xi and, yes. and so it's it's been an interesting process watching the two leaders. Have you been engaged in some of those conversations? That I have and I think you know a lot of this goes to how we uh, approach this relationship. Uh, you know Prime Minister Modi has uh, and, and uh, President uh, Xi Jinping have been very much engaged with each other um, and I think rather than um, looking at this solely from you know, a race to the top and who's going to win and who's going to be that dominant entity within the region, um, I think it's an opportunity for us as the United States to look at the opportunity that exists for us to proactively engage with both of these countries. There are natural um, alliances that we have with India, frankly, that we wouldn't have with China, given the fact that uh, we've, we're dealing with the largest democracy in the world in India, and we're dealing with a much, much more open society uh, and much more opportunity and openness for the United States at every level, whether you're government or private sector, to be able to go in and work with India. Given that India has uh, some work to do, and I think they're moving in the right direction, in eliminating some of the bureaucratic barriers that have stopped some of this investment in India from happening in the past and increasing the ease of doing business there and attracting people there while maintaining um, their their sovereignty so they can create those jobs and those opportunities for those 600 million young people uh, who are um, ready and rearing to go. So I think the bottom line is, is keeping a positive look um, you know, we are better off as a country if we're proactively engaging rather than standing off from a distance and watching things happen before our eyes. I think there are um, a number of organizations that are available to, uh, whether it's a small, medium-sized entity or even an NGO, who are looking to engage further in India. Uh, I've met with a lot of folks from the U.S. India Business Council who deal with a lot of folks, you know, from the smallest to the largest um, size entities. And there are other organizations that can help navigate through kind of the current state of affairs. Um, you know, there's progress to be made. There's no question about that. Uh, within India itself, uh, Prime Minister Modi is dealing with a uh, split, um, a split parliament, much like we've been dealing with here, where uh, the lower house is solidly in his corner and the upper house is solidly not, uh, and working to obstruct much of the many of the initiatives that he's putting forward. Uh, and frankly, he's he's been left to, and a lot of the changes that we've seen so far have come about because of his own um, executive action. Uh, so there are some parallels to the political dynamic that we have here that he's dealing with there. Uh, but for those who are interested in, in kind of reaching out and who want to gain a higher level of confidence before taking the plunge, uh, I think there are a number of organizations, depending on your niche area or your field, that you can reach out to that can kind of help, um, you know, with lessons learned and paving the way and with building those bridges and, and providing those contacts. Well, I think this is a, a great way to start this day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your patience and being flexible with the vote schedule. <laughs> Hopefully the rest will be coming soon. Thank you. Aloha.